back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Mainstream media admits it gets fed info by U.S. Intel, plus what Americans fear most. But first, the obituary for the embattled Great Barrier Reef slammed for hyperbole. While the Great Barrier Reef, the largest living structure on the planet, might be in a dire state, it's not dead yet. However, a recent obituary for the reef went viral, indicating the public appeal of global warming-inspired doom porn. On October 11th, Outside Magazine's website published Obituary, Great Barrier Reef, 25 million B.C. to 2016, in which the author detailed the Great Barrier Reef's attributes as well as the damage done by warming, more acidic ocean water to the complex 133,000 square mile system off of Australia's coast. So now, James, when I start to see information like this come out, the first thing I will do is go look at the organization. What is it? Who runs it? Outside Magazine, which will include the links in the show notes, was founded actually by Rolling Stone's Jan Winner, Jan Winner, who, by the way, just sold 49% of Rolling Stone to a rich kid in Singapore. He was the first editor-in-chief of Outside Magazine. William Randolph Hearst III was its first managing editor. And Jack Ford, an assistant to founding publisher Donald Welch, was the son of former U.S. President and Warren Commission member Gerald Ford. So that's just a little insight into what Outside Magazine may be about. And another piece from ScienceMag.org, some relief for the Great Barrier Reef, I guess to sort of push back against the, against the obituary. The Australian government announced that substantial progress has been made toward protecting the Great Barrier Reef. Conservationists applauded improvements in the reef's health and resilience, but of course went on to caution that the government isn't doing enough. So... James, another situation where the reports of its death might be greatly exaggerated? Absolutely so. And this is the way the global warming inspired doom porn works. It's report every scrap of information that leans towards the negative and ignore every scrap of information that counters that narrative. And I mean, a good example is the ozone hole layer. Um, every time, you know, there's, oh, the ozone hole layer is, is uh, the, ho the hole is growing. Uh, and then when it suddenly heals itself I mean, people just you know it just gets swept under the rug so this is another example of that phenomenon i'll add even a little bit more grist to the mill um even the australian institute of marine science for example earlier this year in june had a report on the surveys of the townsville sector of the great barrier reef that included such highlights as seven reefs in the townsville had coral cover equal to or greater than that recorded since systematic mantatoes began 31 years ago and coral cover had increased on 11 of the 12 reefs surveyed using mantatoes toes. But again, you're not going to find headlines about that because that doesn't sell newspapers or, you know, ad advertising on websites or anything. It's the doom porn that, that gets people's attention. Oh, I knew it. The world is dying. It's, it's, all, it's all going to hell. Um, so who are the real people who are interested in actually preserving the reef? Clearly, it isn't the people who get their um, clicks generated by putting out the doom porn and, and accentuating anything that could possibly be twisted to the negative, it's the people who actually make their living for, on the reef. Um, so the tourism operators who need the reef to do what they do are the ones that are most directly invested, quote unquote, in the protection of the reef. So what do they have to say about this? And I'll throw in a link to an article by uh, Jacinda Tutty ta uh, talking to some of the, the uh, tourism operators and what they think about this constant doom porn, the reef is dead kind of thing that uh, is directly impacting their lives and the fact that they're, they're the ones that are trying the hardest to actually save the reef. So um, there's a lot of this narrative that needs to be fought back because there are so many stories like this where it, it of course you love the you love the planet and you want to go green that means that you have to buy hook line and sinker every story that comes out about everything related to the environment whereas we have time after time after time all of these green scares being uh, being having their own agendas the ddt scare and things like that that end up killing millions upon millions of people because well we can't have ddt because well, it seems like it's going to be damaging to the environment, and then it doesn't. Meanwhile, real, genuine environmental emergencies, the, uh, the, uh, the pesticides and things that are killing off, the, 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 killing off the, the, the bees and things like that, well, we'll create robo-bees. That kind of 
insanity that gets you know that that gets a mention in some of the science oh look at this is kind of cool look they're making robo bees um you know real environmental emergencies get swept under the rug and so as another example of that i'll throw it back to you for a uh, an example of the the global warming doom porn on the climate side well and i would i was just saying for more on the robo bees see our our previous episode of new world next week uh the story you're talking about, James, I actually went through the hallway this morning on my morning show. Warming alarmists redefine what a hurricane is so that we'll have more of them. And I basically just comp- – I mean you can make simple analogies of it's moving the goalpost. So since we hadn't actually had any big hurricanes in the last 11 years, it was only when Hurricane Matthew hit in the last couple of weeks that Mashable and other – again – mainstream outlets with vested interests in the people who will actually make money off of climate control and not the regular people who are just fishing and, and living their lives you kind of see who's 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 benefiting from this and it's another kind of classic case again of, of kind of changing the rules in the middle of the game to affect people who are watching all of this and who never question any of this Everything we say is always included down in the show notes, so you can follow the links and do more research for yourself. And again, we always want to thank everybody who submits stories. This is mostly a crowdsourced kind of show anymore, using hashtag New World Next Week. Our second story, James, this week is a really convoluted story, and it actually comes from the source of some of the controversy. Newsweek journalist claims U.S. intelligence fed him false Putin-Trump conspiracy. Sputnik News notes that an error made by a Sputnik News editor revealed shocking information that U.S. intelligence agencies may be actively trying to manipulate the presidential election while also spying on Sputnik's staff of U.S. citizens. So, again, this is a long story to go through, James, and I'll admit I kind of glazed over when I got to the part where it said, and then he blocked him on Twitter. It's like, oh, God. Okay, so this is a big, long story, which, again, you can read all the way through on Sputnik. There's a good comment at the bottom that fortunately actually makes it kind of succinct that says, dirty reporters working for Hillary are being helped by U.S. intelligence to spread fake stories about Russian support for Trump. When dirty reporter was caught, he offered a quid pro quo job in exchange for silence. And that's pretty much consistent with everything else that we see spilling out day by day by day. James? This is a slightly complicated story. So you do have to read through it to get what happened and when, then what was the response and then what was the response to the response to get what the story is actually about. But it revolves around this, uh, this story that was written based on a tweet that was, that was misleading. And so the, the reporter, uh, it was basically a story that... that that wasn't correct. So they pulled it off Sputnik news site after I think 19 minutes or something it being up there. But within that 19 minute time frame, somehow the, uh, this Newsweek reporter had picked up on that story that was posted to, to Sputnik and was using it as part of this Putin Trump conspiracy thing that he was painting. Um, so the question is, well, how did he know? And then so what is apparently supposedly revealed in these emails is, oh, well, you know, the, I'm not re- watching Sputnik News 24-7, but there are people in the intelligence agencies who are, and, uh, you know, they, they pick up on this sort of thing. So that being said, one of the takeaways from this story is that there is a war that's being waged through the media right now um, between the U.S. and Russia and, you know, other other nations as well, uh, intelligence agencies, really. Um and what that means for us is that we cannot take any story, including this story, at face value and just run with it as if we know what this is really about. Because there are ulterior agendas behind everything, ulterior agendas that the reporter reporting on it doesn't even necessarily know for themselves. And um, I think a good example of that, uh, which occurred quite recently... The Russian cyber war, you know, we're going to start a cyber war with Russia. The CIA, shh, everybody, shh, the CIA has a secret shh plan for confronting the Russians. And, I mean, it's so on its face ridiculous. Of course the CIA isn't announcing their super secret cyber warfare plans to the entire world via NBC News. Uh, we have to be smart about this. Don't just pick up a story like that and run with it because, oh, you know, look, it's the truth. No, of course there are different motives for reporting different stories in different ways at different times to different audiences, and we have to be savvier about that rather than just running with any story that comes across the newswires. This one included, I 
mean, how do we know that Moran is portraying this correctly? How do we know what Eichenwald was? I mean, there's layers of obfuscation going on in stories like this that obviously do relate to uh, geopolitical intelligence rivalries and things that are happening behind the scenes that we only but dimly comprehend. So I think there's we have to be smart about this. Don't run with every story as soon as it appears in the way that it appears. And there's a lot more examples of this. And I think I'll probably put together a video fairly soon on on this and why it is important for us to be to at least hold back on stories like this. And it, I mean, it is interesting to see, though, again, in the alleged exchanges of, of these emails between Moran and Eichenwald, sort of how quick Newsweek's Eichenwald is to say, well, you know, I'm pretty tight with the U.S. intelligence community. I don't know if it's a brag or a threat or both or hubris or, or who knows. And James, perhaps this is the third week in a row, I believe, where our main stories are basically advertising the news as advertising slash propaganda. And it all kind of has different target audiences and different kind of market niches, if you will. My other magazine bit for you, James, who's behind Newsweek? That's the musical question that Mother Jones asked back in 2014. And it turns out it's IB Times, International Business Times, one of those new websites that's kind of popped up in the last several years that seems to do pretty decent work as most of the other kind of mainstream media work kind of falls by the wayside. In this article from Mother Jones, they note that the new owners, IB Times, are anxious to hide their ties to an enigmatic religious figure. And what this makes me think of is kind of the shout and fraud, I guess, the shameful joy of watching both phony sides tear each other apart. And I spent a little bit of time earlier today because I hadn't actually watched the videos yet. But the clips coming out from James O'Keefe and the Project Veritas thing are pretty stunning is the only word I can use. And James, when you and I were talking just a little bit off mic, like a stunning is that I was like, eh, don't get me wrong. I'm not shocked that, of course, they use false flag attacks and incite violence and are rigging the voting and bussing people in. And it's all a fraud and a charade. What's shocking is really the level of criminality on display. I mean, one of the quotes, it doesn't matter what the friggin' legal and ethics people say. We need to win this mother effort. And those are the kinds of things they've said, and they've been caught on camera. Vote rigging Democratic operative Bob Kramer visited the White House 340 times since 2009. Our friend Claire Burnish tweeted that out. So basically, they are still at, at least 20 more days left of America's next top president. And there's plenty of paranoia to go around. There's fears about Julian Assange. He's been black bagged and he's off to Guantanamo. The clown apocalypse, the purge, plus the last debate, which starts in just a few minutes after we're taping this episode. Add all of that up and you've got a masterfully manipulated mass of Americans, which leads to our third and final story this week. What do Americans fear most? Chapman University's third annual survey of American fears released. Chapman University, for the third time, released their survey of American fears. They asked respondents about 65 fears across a broad range of categories. Government, crime, environment, future, technology, health, natural disasters, public speaking, spiders, heights, ghosts. In addition, James, this is where it got interesting. To the set of fears examined in the previous years, the survey took a closer look at two fear-related phenomena, Americans' belief in conspiracy theories and fear of Muslims, a.k.a. Islamophobia. So belief in conspiracy theories were a new element to the 2016 survey, which included the classic questions JFK and others. So what they learned is more than half of all Americans believe the government is concealing information about the 9-11 attacks, the conspiracy with the most amount of belief behind it. Also, JFK making up a, a close second. Another 40% believe the government is hiding information about extraterrestrials and global warming. One third believe there are conspiracies surrounding Obama's birth certificate and the origin of the AIDS virus. Also, nearly one fourth of Americans also believe there's something suspicious about the death of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. So in further links, and again, all of this will be included as, of course, anytime we're talking about research, there's lots of links and lots of other ancillary materials and PDFs and such. What they aren't telling us, that's the conspiracy subheader. Perhaps most indicative of the conspiratorial nature of Americans is the 10th conspiracy theory they asked about. Respondents to the Chapman University Survey of American Fears were asked if, quote, the government is concealing what they know about the North Dakota crash. 
a third of Americans, 33 percent, think the government is concealing information about this invented event. Were that North Dakota crash added to the ranked list of conspiracies, that invention would rank as number six just behind plans for a one world government. But they made it up about the North Dakota crash, which is a fantastic way, James, to say, shut up, conspiracy theorist. Indeed. But actually, what that the only thing that really shows is how <laughs> flawed these types of polls inherently are, because people are going to be responding when a pollster's in their face asking them questions. They're going to be responding as if they know what they're talking about, even if they don't. And they're going to give you an answer. So if you give them a misleading question, of course they're going to, and a lot of people are going to answer it. Um, that is obviously a gotcha that's implanted in there, but I think it says more about the polling and what we can trust about these polls rather than about, you know, the, the, the American public's response to this. At any rate, I mean, to whatever extent we can trust this, I mean, we could have fun with these numbers uh, and say, well, if 54.3% of Americans strongly agree or agree that the, the U.S. government is covering up the 9-11 truth, well, that means there are more 9-11 truthers in America than will probably go to the polls on November 8th. So, I mean, isn't that an, uh, that's a pretty amazing thing, isn't it? No, no, that's not a headline that's that's worth reporting on. Anyway, for the uh, the headline takeaway that might be a better headline, uh, Live Science has it up. Half of Americans believe in 9-11 conspiracy theories, which, hey, is, sounds like great news. Of course, they go on to talk about, oh, and they believe in moon landings and uh, faked and uh, aliens uh, visit uh, Elvis and, you know, whatever. Uh, so, of course, they try to lump everything together because if, you know, one conspiracy theory is as stupid as another, right? All of them are equally the same, um, which, again, just shows the bias. But uh, people are savvier about this these days, and there are silly, gullible people in the public who swallow everything up at a, si a site called Live Science or whatever because, hey, it's science. But that section of the public is dwindling, I think, and uh, this this propaganda only works on the most dumbed down. So, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of good things to take away from this. There are a lot of good things. And I'll add this in with the story that you recently covered on Good News next week about, uh, half, uh, what is it, a quarter of Americans are, are losing faith in American democracy, which is great. I mean, of course, that means that they're probably just on board with, you know, some sort of tyranny or dictatorship. But this, this losing faith in democracy is the perfect opportunity to insert ourselves in that mix and say, hey, guys, you want a different way of organizing ourselves? How about freedom cells? How about agorism? How about counter economics? There's lots of uh, opportunity here because the public doesn't believe their lies. This is a great moment. And if this stupid clownish selection cycle gives us anything, it's that both sides are tearing each other apart. I say, great, feed them both to the dogs, let them, you know, die on the vine, and let's grow something new in our garden. And uh, that's, that's what we're attempting to do here with, by spreading this information. That sounds like good news this week. The latest episode of Good News Next Week that you mentioned, the title track is A Prank a Day Keeps the Dog Leash Away about ways to sort of monkey wrench the New World Order. It also includes that story, Losing Faith in Democracy and Building Greenhouses Out of Abandoned Houses. So that and much more you can find using also hashtag Good News Next Week as well. We love you to submit stories using hashtag New World Next Week. James, I got to go watch the debate, man. Yeah, uh, unfortunately I do. I do, so you don't have to. All right, well, let's enjoy <laughs> that. And uh, until next week, talk to you later. All right, man, thanks.